All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as we have more people trickle in, let's get started. Um, so welcome to the SRI seminar series. Um, my name is Ashton Anderson. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of, of uh, CompSci here at the University of Toronto. Uh, and I am a research lead at the schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and so, uh, Society. Uh, so for before, uh, before we begin today, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. Uh, for thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most re uh, re uh, recently, the Mississaugas of the, of the credit. These and other Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island <clears throat> developed complex and effective governance systems based on respect for all life and the intelligence of the natural world. Today, this land is still home to many Indigenous people who are working to reclaim their rights to self-governance, uh, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Although we, we may all be joining from different places, we encourage you to reflect on the history and relations of the land that you live and work on. Okay, so a few uh, bookkeeping uh, notes before we get started. Uh, this session is being re uh, recorded. Uh, David's going to speak for about 50 minutes and we'll take questions after the talk, um, but you can ask clarifying questions during it uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, and during the question answering portion of the seminar, uh, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom, uh, and then uh, we'll call on you to ask, ask a question. Okay, uh, so now it's time for the main event. Uh, it's my honor to introduce today's speaker, David Rand. Um, David is really a giant in my little world. Um, he's the Irwin Shell Professor um, and the prof uh, um, a Professor of Management Science and Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. He's a director of, applied co of the Applied Cooperation Team. Uh, he's an affiliate of the MIT Institute of Data Systems and Society and the Initiative on the Digital Economy. David, that's a lot of stuff. Uh, he bridges the fields of cognitive science, uh, behavioral economics, and social psych. Um, and David's research combines uh, com uh, behavioral experiments run online, which I'm sure we'll see today, um, and um, oh, sorry, and in the field with mathematical and computational models to understand people's attitudes, beliefs, and choices. His work uses a cognitive science per, uh, per perspective grounded in the tension between intuitive versus de uh, deliberative modes of uh, de uh, decision making to illuminate why people believe and share misinformation uh, in, uh, to better understand political psych uh, and polarization and promote human co uh, cooperation. Uh, David received his PhD in systems bio from Harvard in 2009, where he went on to complete his postdoc and was a professor of psychology, economics, and management at Yale prior to joining the faculty at MIT. So before, uh, without further ado, David, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, you know, thanks for the, the nice introduction and for the chance to speak uh, here. I'm looking forward to telling you about some research that my group has been doing recently. Um, and also, I just want to say that in addition to raising your hand, if people want to put type chats in, type questions in the chat, I'll be monitoring the chat uh, at the same time, so that's another effective way to do it. Uh, and also, I'll use the chat to drop links to relevant papers and stuff like that as they as they come up in the talk. So, um, without uh, further ado, um, today I'm going to talk about how polarization can help solve the misinformation problem. Um, so, uh, and actually, maybe just as one uh, opening thing um, in the chat. We have like my group. This is like one piece of work that my group has done on this information. We have a lot of different things going on, and so this Google Doc is like a living document, and we add links to all of the papers um, that my, my group and Gord Penny Cook's group, uh, with whom I cooperate on most of this stuff, uh, have done. So, okay, um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, okay. Actually, before I before I get into the actual talk, I just want to acknowledge. The many uh, people that um, are part of my like extended research network, and in particular, the work that I'm talking about today uh, is led by grad students Jenny Allen and Karen Martell, both of whom are extremely good, and I feel very lucky to work with. Um, and also acknowledge our funders, uh, who I feel very happy to have gotten money from. And from a COI or conflict of interest perspective, which I do get research funding from Meta and from Google. Um, so. Uh, the, the talk that I'm going to give today sort of brings together two different um, literatures or strands of work. There's been a lot of uh, research on polarization um, and, you know, how in the U.S. 
uh, and around the world, but in particular in the U.S. today, pol like um, political tensions are higher than they've uh, they've ever been in terms of animosity between uh, you know people in different parties, um, and this is widely seen as a negative force in society, um, causing lots of different um, harms. And so there's been a lot of work on that, as summarized by this uh, this opinion piece or sort of review piece uh, in Science uh, a few years ago. Um, and then uh, in parallel to this, there's also um, a, sorry. Uh, in parallel to that work, there also um, is a big body of research where I have been uh, most active in recent years trying to understand misinformation. Um, obviously, like falsehoods have been around uh, as long as communication has been around, but there's been a particular flavor of false claims, uh, you know, presented as if they were true news and circulating widely, particularly on social media, that kind of came to general attention during the 2016 election, both with uh, Brexit in the UK and the US presidential election here uh, in the US. Um, and during COVID, there was a lot of concern about COVID misinformation, the sort of infodemic happening in parallel to the actual pandemic. Um, and uh, the 2020 US election had you know, another round of, <clears throat> uh, of uh, widespread false claims. Um, and obviously it's also not only contained to the US and Western Europe, uh, misinformation is really like a, a global problem. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work on trying to understand the psychology of misinformation. This review article uh, synthesizes a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in addition to trying to understand the psychology of why people believe and share false claims, um, you know, I'm really interested in trying to do work that, uh, you know, has some positive impact or that is, that is useful. Uh, and so, like, a core question there is how to combat misinformation. Um, and uh, what I'm going to argue in this talk is that although there may be uh, a lot of negative consequences of polarization in various domains, um, combating misinformation is actually a play where, place where polarization may turn out to be helpful uh, rather than harmful. So um, before we get there, I need to do a little bit of laying the groundwork to just think about how is it uh, that people are combating misinformation. And I'm particularly going to focus on misinformation that circulates on social media. Um, social media has gotten, you know, the lion's share of attention uh, in discussion around misinformation. I actually think it's not at all clear that social media is the most important place for the spread of misinformation. I think that, uh, you know, traditional uh, media, TV, and conservative talk radio, um, well, let's say talk radio, uh, are also like major vectors of misinformation that are like, do not get nearly enough attention. Um, but I'm going to focus on social media uh, because I think it's a place where there's the greatest possibility for intervention, which is to say, um, you know, if I think that Fox News uh, produces a lot of misinformation and distributes a lot of misinformation, uh, this, the, the, the organization that's making the misinformation is the same one as the organization that's distributing it. So there's no room for intervention. Like if we came up with some intervention, they would not be interested in applying it. Whereas with social media companies, the, the organization that does the distribution, the platform is different from the people that are producing the actual information themselves. And so if the platforms wanted to do, there's more space to actually successfully intervene. So that's why I focus on uh, social media. And currently the, the primary way that social media companies are combating this information is using machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence to try and develop classifiers, so like models that can predict uh, whether pieces of content they see are true or accurate or inaccurate. Um, and you know that's great. Like machine learning is you know great. Some of my best friends are computers, uh, but it's not it's not uh, sufficient to totally solve the problem. Um, like uh, on the one hand, it turns out it's really hard to make good training sets because um, the, the truth is not a very clear, well-defined, these things are true, these things are false, now train your classifier, but it's more like accuracy exists along a continuum of some things that are clearly not true, some things that clearly are true, and you know, uh, a lot of stuff in the middle. So it makes it hard to, to train models effectively. Plus, um, there's this non-stationarity problem where things are constantly evolving. 
And so the signals that uh, indicate something might be misinformation yesterday are not necessarily going to be useful uh, tomorrow. And so there's a recognition that relying on machine learning alone is not enough and that they need some human in the loop. And so this is typically done by partnering with professional fact checking organizations where expert uh, fact checkers will do detailed research on claims um, and then write up little fact checks about whether they think it's false or misleading or true or whatever. And then they'll distribute that. And then if a piece of content is labeled as false by a professional fact checker or potentially by multiple professional fact checkers, then platforms will say, okay, this is problematic content. And then once they've decided that a piece of content is problematic, either uh, due to their models or due to uh, you know, the fact checker research, there's sort of two main things that they can do about it. They can either demote it, which means uh, this is like an algorithmic intervention where they make it so it's less likely to show up in people's news feeds. So it just reduces the reach of that content. This is sort of definitionally effective in that if people don't see it, it can't have any influence on them. Uh, or the other thing that people, uh, that platforms can do is put warning labels on content and, you know, say like, you know, false or disputed by fact checkers or things like that. Um, and warning labels actually are also widely effective. Um, there's a lot of research showing that if you put a warning on something, people believe it less, people share it less. Um, and we, uh, we have a paper that we're working on now that shows evidence that even people who say they don't trust professional fact checkers and who don't want to see fact checks, if you show them the fact checks anyways, it reduces their belief and it reduces their sharing. So warnings are great. Um, and so I think the problem is that, uh, you know, you can demote content that's bad and you can put warning labels on it, but the real challenge for identifying misinformation online is a problem of scale. There's just such a massive amount of content that is posted online every day uh, that there's no possible way that uh, that the professional fact checkers can at all keep up. Um, and so what I'm going to uh, talk about in this talk is one approach for trying to identify misinformation at scale to supplement professional fact checkers um, and you know uh, machine learning classifiers. And uh, the way that uh, you can do this is by harnessing the wisdom of crowds. So there's the huge literature going back more than 100 years um, suggesting that if you synthesize the uh, guesses of a large number of non-experts, um, you can wind up doing as well uh, or better than the judgments of experts. You know, the classic original example was uh, Galton went to a county fair where everyone was guessing the weight of an ox, one of these competitions. He collected all the guesses. Uh, and although most people were very wrong, they were sort of wrong in a symmetric way, such that when you average them out, their uh, guess was actually extremely accurate. And uh, this has been shown to be uh, true across a really wide range of topics. So the question is, does it also work in the context of um, this sort of highly politicized uh, world of misinformation and, uh, and news. And um, this, this paper that I'm gonna talk about now is not the main paper for the day. It's just like the, the, the appetizer sort of setting the scene. Um, we did this project. It was a collaboration with Facebook who was designing a, like a crowdsourcing uh, like product uh, on Facebook. Um, and uh, what we did is we got them to give us a set of 200 headlines that their algorithms had selected as things they wanted fact checks on, either because they had reason to think they were inaccurate or just because they were from, um, they were like going viral or they were about important topics. <clears throat> and so for each of these articles, we hired three professional fact checkers to do detailed research uh, on the whole article and can you know, rate how accurate it was using a variety of different uh, seven point Likert scales. And then we also got about 1100 American lay people from Amazon Mechanical Turk, who we just showed them the headline and the lead sentence um, and had them rate that. So you know, these are people working for 10 or 15 cents a minute um, with no expertise. And we also varied whether we showed them the source domain or not. Um, and what we wanted to know was, how well do the results of the fact checkers research um, line up with the results of the politically balanced crowd uh, crowd raters? Um, or, you know, sort of how well could you reproduce the fact checker ratings 
from the crowd ratings. And uh, the here, I'll drop a link to this paper. And so here, uh, I'm going to show you the, um, and we also we wanted to know this as a function of how big the crowd was. Because say the crowd could do really well, but you need a thousand people to rate every article. That's not going to be useful from the scaling perspective, which is really our sort of driving motivation here is how can you do this in a scalable way? Um, and so uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to show you here is on the y-axis is the correlation between the, lay the layperson headline ratings and the fact checker research based ratings. And on the x-axis, I'm going to show you the number of layperson ratings per article. Um, you know, and here we're going to show you whether we gave them the information about the source or not. And you know, we need some kind of benchmark. Like obviously a correlation of one is great and a correlation of zero is bad, but like how good counts as good. And um, what we, uh, yeah, so what they were asked is there was a set seven, uh, seven point Likert scales. So it was like how, you know, does this event, to what extent does this describe an event that actually happened from not at all to very much, like how accurate is it? How true is it? How trustworthy is it? How objective is it? How unbiased is it? Uh, something like that. And we combine them. They're like very highly correlated with each other. So we combine all of those ratings into a scale that's just like sort of the accuracy scale. And then we average, we compare the average of the accuracy scale from the lay people with the accuracy scale from the fact checkers. Um, and what I'm going to take as my baseline is the correlation between the fact checkers because we had three fact checkers and, you know, their ratings correlated at like 0.62 which you know is very high. It's higher than anything you see in social science research usually, but it's like very, it's also far from one. So they were not in perfect agreement. And so we sort of wouldn't really expect the crowd to be able to match the fact checkers much better than the fact checkers can match each other. Um, and so with that baseline in mind, uh, this is what we see. You see that with about 10 or 15 lay people rating each headline, you get as much agreement between the fact checkers and the, and the lay people as you do amongst the fact checkers themselves. Uh, and this was equally true for political versus non-political headlines. Actually, it did somewhat better relative to the fact checkers on political headlines than non-political headlines. Um, and I should say these are, we made politically balanced groups of lay people. So these lay people groups were half Democrats, half Republicans. Um, and so uh, I think that this suggests that, um, you know, crowd ratings can be useful uh, as a way of getting some signal. I mean, it's not perfect, but it gives you some signal on, like a good amount of signal on how accurate the, um, the content is. It's not true only in the US. We also have another paper um, where we did a big cross-cultural uh, study on, um, on misinformation that included a bunch of different things on 16, 16 different countries. Um, but, but one of the things that was in there is we got them to rate the accuracy of a set of true and false COVID-19 statements. And then we can do the same exercise where we look at how well you can predict whether the headline is true or not, as judged by fact checkers, based on the average accuracy ratings of the lay people. And we can do it for each of these different 16 countries. And what you see is that um, everywhere, 20 lay people per article can do better than like, you know, an AUC of 0.85, so like an accuracy of 85% in a balanced uh, stimulus set. And almost everywhere, they can do greater than uh, 0.9. So it's not just the US uh, where uh, crowds are doing well. And this approach um, is something that has been adopted by Facebook. They have, as I mentioned, they do this uh, community review. And the way it works is that's actually extremely similar to what happens in our surveys, which is they basically just pay non-experts to uh, fact check articles. And they, people don't get to choose what they do. They just say, they sit down and say, OK, here's, here's an article fact check this one, how accurate do you think it is? Okay, here's another one, fact check this, how accurate do you think it is? And then they use those ratings uh, to help inform their uh, machine learning algorithms and to sort of escalate things to evaluation by professional fact checkers. And based on our work, we have good reason to think that this you know, should actually give you pretty good signal. But even this is not really uh, able to meet the scale of the misinformation problem because even if you're paying people non-expert rates, say even if you were paying people minimum wage, and probably you're gonna to wanna to pay them a little more than minimum wage if you want quality, but even if you were paying people minimum wage, <clears throat> there's just so much stuff posted every day that you will not have nearly enough raters. That is, it will be like way too expensive to do this 
in a, a serious way. And so if you really want to get to a point where you are using crowdsourcing to evaluate the accuracy of content at the scale of the internet, you need people uh, to do it in a volunteer way, which is to say you, you have to have just like regular users on platform flagging bad things, uh, you know, flagging things that they that they see that are problematic. And so the question is, uh, do these previous results that we have of saying crowds where you are sort of controlling what people are rating and being like, here, rate this, here, rate this, here, rate this, uh, does that extend to uh, what happens in this more kind of free form situation? And uh, the, the primary reason that I was actually very skeptical that this would work is that I think this is a situation uh, or context that is much more susceptible to like partisan motives and animosity and so on. Um, so this is, I, I asked chat GPT or I asked Dali to draw me a picture of a red elephant and a blue donkey like fighting over a flag. And this is what it came up. It's actually a blue elephant, but you know, it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, you know, it'll, it'll get there one day. Anyways, the point is that um, in this context where uh, you can just like choose what to flag, you have much more of a chance, I think, of political motivations interfering with things um, because people can do brigading and you know coordinated attacks and like people can like seek out content that they that they dislike and flag it. And so that was the concern is that in this context things are not going to work that well. Um, uh, and so that was the sort of intuition uh, that you know you, you might approach this with and that I had been thinking about this originally. And the, but before we do this, or rather like you know, and we're going to investigate this empirically. But before investigating empirically, I want to start by just trying to think from a more theoretical perspective about what we should actually expect to happen here. And we wanna do this by thinking about what is it that would motivate people to flag inaccurate content in the first place. And obviously there's a lot of different motivations, but I'm gonna focus on two things that I think are like two primary motiva motivations. First one, which is the thing that, you know, is the positive motivation that we hope, uh, oh, well, okay, yeah, the GPT question. Uh, it is actually a very interesting question um, we are working on for, for the, actually for exactly that one that I just showed you, where we had those articles fact checked by the lay people and the fact checkers. Like on my to do list is also get someone to run them all through Chat GPT and just like see how well Chat GPT's ratings uh, shake out. Um, so maybe, but at least so far, I feel like Chat GPT like accuracy has not necessarily been its great strength. Like it's more like you need to fact check the, the GPT. Um, but uh, you know, we'll we'll see how that all shakes out. But um, okay, so why do why do people flag content? You might care about the truth and therefore be motivated to reduce the spread of false content. That would be great. Um, but on the other hand, you might care about partisanship, in which case you would want to reduce uh, the reach of counterpartisan content, and you want to want to boost the reach the reach of copartisan content, regardless of whether it's true or not. If you were just driven by a partisan motivation. <clears throat> and if you think about how these um, motives fit together, uh, you can, you know, obviously, as I said in the beginning, all of this stuff exists along a continuum of how true versus false it is and how aligned with your politics versus not aligned with your politics it is. But just as like a, a simplification to, to think about this in kind of uh, a straightforward way, or we're going to dichotomize these and imagine there's four types of content. It can either be true or false and it can be either aligned with your politics or not aligned with your politics. And so uh, if you were motivated to buy truth and what you were trying to do is reduce falsehoods, then you would flag the false stuff regardless of whether it aligns with your politics or not. Um, conversely, if you cared about partisanship, uh, then you would flag the discordant stuff regardless of whether it was true or false. Uh, the yellow is good, orange is bad. And this is, the, this is essentially the 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 theory about like why you would expect partisanship to be a negative force here is that it is going to lead people to flag things that are true but not aligned with their politics okay um and that you know makes sense but i want to think about it a little bit more formally this is an extremely minimal uh formal model where you imagine that when a person is thinking about whether or not to flag a piece of content uh, the amount of utility they get from flagging it is 
some constant times whether it's false, so this constant maps how much you care about accuracy, plus some constant, which is how much you care about partisanship, where you, you get utility from flagging discordant things and you lose utility or you get disutility from flagging things that are concordant. And then there's just some fixed cost of flagging that'll normalize to one. And then you can just use some logistic function to map uh, this utility into the probability of flagging. And so basically this is just saying uh, accuracy makes you want to flag false stuff. The accuracy motive wants to do, makes you want to flag false stuff. Partisan motive makes you want to flag discordant stuff and not flag concordant stuff. And with that, you can then think about, okay, so you know what's going to happen? First of all, uh, this perspective says people should never flag content that is true and aligned with their politics because there's just like no motive to do that. Um, also from this uh, model, you get the prediction that as people's partisan motives get stronger, there's always going to be more partisan bias in flagging, which is to say biases. They're always going to, like the more partisan they are, the more they're going to tend to flag discordant claims relative to concordant claims. So that makes sense. But the thing that's really interesting is uh, or that is the key question, is what's the effect of the partisan motives on flag discernment? That is the extent to which they're flagging false claims uh, relative to true claims. So this is basically like how good are they doing at actually creating signal on whether the content is accurate or not accurate. And uh, what you can do with that simple model is you can uh, plot this out. And so what I'm going to show you here, remember this is this is predictions from a from a a formal model. This is not data yet, but here the prediction is uh, on this axis, I'm going to show you how much the person cares about accuracy. On this axis, I'm going to tell you how much the person cares about politics. Um, and then I'm going to show you their flagging discernment. So blue means they're doing a really good job. At one, they're flagging like all the true stuff and none of the false stuff. At bright red, they're doing a bad job and they're equally likely to flag true and false and wherever in between is in between. So let's start by looking at the case where people care a lot about accuracy. At baseline, they have a strong accuracy motive. In this case, um, when the partisan motive is weak, they're doing a really good job. Uh, they're basically only flagging false discordant in red and false concord. They're flagging all the false stuff and none of the true stuff, and that's great. And then as the partisan motive increases, things get worse and worse and worse. And that's because they stop flagging the false concordant stuff and they start flagging true discordant stuff. And this is the sort of what I think everyone has in mind when they think about partisan motives being bad for uh, you know, people's flagging behaviors. Essentially, it's gonna motivate you to flag stuff that's true, but you disagree with, and it's gonna motivate you to not flag stuff that's false, but you do agree with. Okay, so then the question is what happens in this space uh, down here where the accuracy motive is not actually so strong? And what's interesting is that actually down here, we see a very different pattern where without any, act, without any partisan motive, uh, people are not doing a good job. Basically, they just don't flag anything because they don't care about accuracy enough in order to motivate them to flag. And then as the partisan motive increases, the quality of their flags actually gets better. And that's because there's in this region here, which is sort of this chunk, uh, they're only they're flagging stuff that is false and discordant. So they're not motivated enough by accuracy to flag things just because it's false. They're not motivated enough by partisanship to flag things just because it's discordant. But if it's both false and discordant, then that makes people really mad. And like that produces enough of motivation for them to get up and put in the effort to flag things. And then eventually if the partisan motive gets too high, then you're back in the situation where they're just flagging everything they disagree with. But the key point is that there's this big region here where uh, they are actually producing quality flags. They're only flagging things that are false. They happen to only be flagging things that they disagree with too, but it's only the false disagreed stuff uh, that's getting flagged. And so that's, um, that's sort of like the key prediction that comes out of the model is that actually it's not clear um, like what the effect of partisan motives on flagging is gonna be. Although it always increases bias, it might be negative if there was a strong accuracy motive, but it might actually be positive if there is a weak accuracy motive. Again, because in that case, you're only 
you're only motivated enough to flag claims that are both false and discordant. Um, and just to clarify again, this is not data. This is this is like this is a theory. This is like a model um, where bipartisan motive we mean just like getting utility from flagging things that you disagree with. But uh, what we want to do now is like actually test it empirically. Um, and so I'm going to show you two different ways that we that we test this empirically. The first one is with uh, an experiment that we ran. We recruited almost 2,400 Americans from uh, Lucid, the quota matched to the national distribution on age, gender, ethnicity, and region. Um, and we used a setup that's a little bit different from uh, the way we normally do things, where we explicitly ask people to help social media companies identify misinformation. Um, and then we showed them a news feed where they could flag articles as false or misleading and write explanations. And just to show you what I mean about it being different from usual is normally, you know, we try to really minimize them thinking about, you know, who the experimenter is or whatever. But in this one, we said, look, we're researchers at MIT. We advise social media companies. We've shown that crowds can do a good job. Here, read this article we wrote in Time about it if you want. Here, we are recruiting you basically to help uh, actually identify misinformation for social media companies. So we're basically asking them, we're saying like, you guys are, are doing this task to really help, uh, you know, it's, it's a real task, it's not just a study. Um, and then we showed them uh, this scrolling news feed that I'll show you in a minute. Um, there were 30 true items in it, half of them right-leaning and half of them left-leaning. There were 30 false items, half of them right-leaning and half of them uh, left-leaning. And then there was 20 non-political pieces of content mixed in. Um, and it looks uh, something like this. Um, you know, you can just sort of scroll through. And then uh, if there was any uh, claim that you decided uh, was not accurate, you can click the flag button and that flags it. And then you have to write an explanation about why you think it's false. And so here the person flicks, clicks it and say, why did you flag it? And you have to write a justification. And we have them write the justification to make some amount of cost uh, to flagging so that it's not just like people are flagging whatever like if you want to flag it you have to write you know some kind of like actually reasonable uh, reason for it. So that's the setup <clears throat> and then what we want to know is okay what are people actually flagging and uh, because for each person um, we know we asked about their political orientation so we can classify each person as a uh, you know right leaning or left leaning. And then we have each headline as either right-leaning or left-leaning. We can say um, the political headlines are either concordant, so the person, like the person's politics matches the politics of the headline, or they're discordant, they don't match. Um, and then they can either be false or true and can be news or not news. Um, uh, how do you check how accurate it? Yeah, so we didn't, no, we basically we don't use the explanation. That's, that's, that's something so far, we have just been looking at the flags and we've just been thinking of the explanations as something we put in to create a cost for flagging, but that's obviously a super interesting data source where we now have like a huge number of these actual explanations that people wrote. Um, and that I feel like is gonna be an important thing for follow-up is to say like how, like for example, can you increase the quality of the signal that you get by weighting the flags based on how good the explanations are or something like that. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to show you is the fraction of each of these different types of headlines uh, that are flagged. Um, and remember, the prediction is that uh, people are going to, like, people are never going to flag things that are true and concordant. Um, if people are motivated by accuracy, they'll flag both false things re regardless of their partisanship. But to the extent that people are in this kind of intermediate region where they only care enough about they don't care enough about accuracy to flag just because it's inaccurate. They don't care enough about partisanship to flag just because it's uh, counterpartisan. But the combination of those two things pro really provide the motive uh, to flag. We would expect more flagging of false discordant than false concordant. Um, and that's what we see. That's a highly significant difference. Um, we see, as expected, very little flagging of true concordant news or of the sort of non news, the celebrity stuff. And then the key question is what happens for the true but discordant headlines. The concern is the flag rate is going to be high for these, um, but that is not what we find. Sort of consistent with basically these people not caring that much about partisanship, 
you see that actually things are overall like looking quite good. Uh, but now we want to try and break this down uh, based on the strength of partisan motive uh, that the person has. And so we measured uh, their partisan motives in uh, a few different ways. We measured it like a measure of affect, standard measure of affective polarization, these feeling thermometers where they say sort of how hot versus cold do you feel, or how warm versus cold do you feel towards Biden supporters, how warm versus cold do you feel towards uh, Trump supporters. Um, or Democrats and Republicans, I think we used in this one. And then we use their sort of level of coolness towards the out party as this measure of uh, how affectively polarized they are. We also used issue polarization where we asked their issue, their stances on a bunch of different issues and looked at how polarized those issue positions were. And we also included a political knowledge measure. Um, political scientists often use political knowledge as a measure, as like a proxy for a political engagement. And if you do a principal compound analysis, on uh, these three items, you get out uh, the a first component that just puts equal weight on all three of them. Um, and so we basically, for our primary polarization index, I'm just going to average all three of these things as this measure of like how polarized are they. Um, but also, I'll tell you a little bit about what happens when you look at them separately. Um, and all the results I'm going to show you, I'm just going to show you the means, but everything that uh, <clears throat> that happens and that I tell you is happening is robust to controlling for um, all the demographics, including partisanship and attentiveness and on attention checks elsewhere in the study. So what I'm gonna show you here now is the same plot that I showed before with a fraction of the five different kinds of news <clears throat> that are getting flagged. But here I'm gonna split, I'm gonna do a median split on this polarization index and compare the less polarized people to the more polarized people. And what you see is that for the less polarized people, <clears throat> they're kind of fairly equally flagging false content, regardless of uh, whether it aligns with their politics or not, which makes sense because they don't care about politics that much. And they're flagging it more than the other stuff, so fine. Um, and then the question is, what happens with the more polarized subjects? And what you see is uh, they are like way more likely to flag the false, uh, I mean, both kinds of false content, but in particular, the false discordant content. And they're not really much more likely to flag the true discord and content. And so uh, this means that polarization correlates positively both with bias. So there, you know, because here, like the, the ratio, like here, there's basically equal amounts of uh, concordant and discordant getting flagged. Whereas here, they're substantially more discordant than concordant getting flagged. So they are more biased, but also they're, uh, they correlates positively with discernment, which is they're flagging way more false relative to true. So overall, you're getting much better signal on identifying the bad content where you're using the, polarized, the more polarized subjects compared to the less polarized subjects. Um, and if you look at the different individual uh, components, um, you get a stronger relationship for political knowledge and for issue polarization than you do for affective polarization. Now, something you might notice here that's uh, maybe surprising is that the polarized people aren't just flagging more false discordant. As I said, they're also flagging more of the false concordant. And so you might be surprised why are more like polarized people more likely to flag things that are false but agree with their side. And the issue is that <clears throat> you know polarization is is correlated with knowledge. As you're saying, political knowledge like loads just as heavily on that factor as the other thing. So partially. These people are not just more polarized, but they're also just more baseline knowledgeable, which I think is what accounts for the better general flagging. Um, uh, yeah, so remember, this is a situation where like they're not rating each headline. They're basically scrolling through and saying, do I want to flag this or not? And so like, <clears throat> I don't think, uh, or I wouldn't interpret the absence of a flag as them saying it's OK, but it's more like, uh, that is, it is certainly true that most content is not getting flagged. And this is the other feature, uh, or let's say challenge for these um, more kind of optional flagging systems, which I guess I should have mentioned earlier on, like one issue is this whole polarization uh, problem, but the other actually much bigger problem is there's it's a free writing, it's like a public goods problem, which is that like, Everyone benefits from bad stuff getting flagged, but it takes effort to like flag something and write an explanation. And so people are sort of like not really inclined at baseline 
to provide flags. And as you see, consistent with this, there's just like not very much flags are not getting provided in general. Um, and so, <clears throat> like I said, the uh, issue polarization is more strongly correlated with discernment than affective polarization. And to understand that why, what I'm going to uh, understand why, what I'm going to show you here now is again, it's going to be like the fraction of the different kinds of content that's flagged as a function of affective polarization. This is just z-squared affective polarization, which again is sort of how cold they feel towards the out party. Um, and what you see is this, uh, this nonlinearity that actually lines up very nicely with the theory, which is um, as people get more polarized, they get more inclined to flag the discordant false stuff. Um, but like when the polarization gets too high, they stop flagging or they become less inclined to flag concordant false and they become a bit more inclined to flag discordant true. So like at the limit of like, and presumably if you had people that were even more affectively polarized in our data set, it might come back down further. And so this is saying like, you know, here the affective polarization is particularly helping in this intermediate region. Uh, so just to summarize uh, so far, in this survey experiment, we found that people were most likely to flag stuff that was false and they disagreed with, uh, followed by things that were false and they agreed with, and there was very little flagging of things that were true, and so discernment was high. Although, as uh, Ashton pointed out, the overall flag rates are low, which highlights this sort of public good problem. Um, and in terms of, of polarization, uh, if you were to exclude the partisan, the more partisan subjects, which is something ex ante, I think a lot of people would have thought would be a good idea. Uh, if you exclude the partisan subjects, actually it makes everything substantially worse. You get worse discernment and you get a much lower volume of flags. Um, so in this setting, the polarization is actually helpful uh, rather than harmful. But you might uh, very reasonably uh, be worried about the uh, ecological validity of this, because on the one hand, in the survey experiment context, people's accuracy motives might be stronger than they would be out in the wild because you're only selecting, basically you're, you're getting only people that are like interested in uh, completing academic surveys. So they'd be more accuracy motivated. Plus they know it's a study. So they're sort of thinking about accuracy and stuff like that. And you might imagine that the partisan motives are weaker here than they would be in, in the field because there's no one actually watching them and uh, you know, they're, they're, it's like, you know, it, it doesn't feel nearly as, as sort of like uh, stimulating and like, you know, emotionally engaging as things do on the real platform. Um, uh, so question is, just the point only to political content. What about motivations to flag based on relevance of the subject to their lives, not political, but rather subjects they consider important? Yeah, so that's a great point. And I think that we, as I said, like earlier, there are lots of different motivations for flagging things. Um, here, we're particularly focusing on the sort of partisan motivation, but I think that you're right that the basic point generalizes to uh, many people have specific niche interests, essentially, that they like care a lot about, and so they are probably will be motivated to flag on those things. Um, but again, hopefully, in general, people will be motivated to flag things, like, unless they're like real zealots and like have a really strong position that they want, you know, to, to, to push on an, an item. They will be flat, they'll be motivated to flag things that are false and they don't agree with. Um, but as we, you'll see, uh, I think that like political, so first of all, it's true that most people don't actually care that much about politics, <clears throat> but I think politics is a much broader uh, interest than most of the kind of like uh, specific, more like niche things that people are interested in. So, uh, anyways, these are reasons to think that these survey results that we got are going to look more optimistic than what you would actually see in the wild. Um, and so in order to evaluate that, uh, the other part of this project is we look at field data from Twitter. Um, and we do this using the Birdwatch uh, program that uh, Twitter introduced uh, in early 2021. The way Birdwatch works is um, you can sort of volunteer to say, I want to evaluate uh, content. Um, they randomly, in, a, in the pilot phase, which is what we're going to look at here, they announced that about 10,000 people said they wanted to do it, and they uh, randomly picked uh, 4,000 people in a way that tried to sort of maximize the diversity of who they allowed into the pilot program. And then once you were in the Birdwatch pilot program, <clears throat> every time that you saw a tweet, you could flag it as potentially misleading 
or not misleading. Almost nobody uses this functionality. Like everybody's flagging things as potentially misleading and then write an explanation. Um, and then that explanation, here's an example, like Amazon saying, oh, we're really great to our workers and someone saying, uh, you know, this is potentially misleading. Amazon has a documented history of labor violations and they put all this stuff in there. Um, as everybody uh, is probably aware, Elon Musk bought Twitter and fired everybody, um, including basically everybody working on anything trust and safety related, except Birdwatch, which he renamed Community Notes. Um, I think accidentally, my best theory is in this tweet, he just referred to it as Community Notes because it looked like notes. And then afterward, they had to rename it. Um, and now it's officially called Community Notes, but at least they didn't get fired. Um, and uh, so this is the one thing Musk likes, even though sometimes uh, they write notes about him. So he posts this thing that is not true. And then uh, it got a birdwatch note saying it's not real, it's satirical. And then he responded saying community notes for the win. So anyways, this is like at least one thing that still exists on Twitter. Uh, and so what we did is we examined uh, a little over 1100 flags um, uh, put on 352 tweets. As I said, only, like 96% of them were people flagging it as misleading. Only 4% were people saying this is not misleading. So we just ignore the 4% of flags that were validating and we just look at the 96% of flags that are saying that the tweet is bad. We hired two professional fact checkers to evaluate each, uh, each tweet. And um, we are gonna call a tweet false if uh, either of the fact checkers said it was potentially misleading and we're gonna call it true if both of the fact checkers said it was not misleading. Um, and then we also had MTurkers rate each tweet on like, if it was true, how good would it be for the Democrats versus Republicans? So we get a sort of political lean on the headline, the same as we are on the tweet, the same as we did on the headlines in the survey experiments. And then we can infer the partisanship of each of the bird watchers based on which accounts they follow using this sort of standard uh, approach. And there were about 10% of bird watchers that didn't follow enough political accounts. So we're like not politically engaged enough to estimate their partisanship. So the partisanship will be NA for those guys. <clears throat> and then I can rate uh, like a note, like a like that is a flag as concordant if the partisan lean of the headline matches the partisan lean of the note writer and discordant if they're opposite. And so now, I can do the same thing that we did in the survey experiment and look at uh, what fraction of the flags were flagging, you know, were like content that was actually misleading versus not actually misleading and aligned with the person's politics uh, versus not aligned with the flagger's politics. And when we look at the false uh, tweets, we see uh, a similar pattern where there was a uh, a lot more flags of false discordant tweets than false concordant tweets. And then again, the question is what's going on over here? We don't expect anybody to do true concordant tweets, but is there gonna be this big spike of lots of people flagging things that they disagree with, but are actually not misleading? And we did not find that at all. So like 80% of the flags uh, were flagging tweets that were also related, uh, rated as potentially misleading by the fact checkers. So. Even here in the survey experiment, like overall the signal, sorry, even here in the field data, like in the survey experiment, the flags are producing really like quite good signal. Um, and again, you can see this is a context where the political motivations actually help. And there's two different ways to think about it. One of that is to think about it at the level of the flag. So imagine that the false discordant uh, tweets, well, let's imagine if the discordant tweets were we treated like the concordant tweets. So then that would be like this. And so if that was the case, uh, you would get similar agreement with the fact checkers, but like half as many flags contributed. So basically like if you were to knock out partisan motives, you wouldn't get any improvement in quality and you'd get a lot lower quantity. Um, and another way to think about it is, uh, what was the skew? Um, I'm not sure, what do you mean by skew? I'm guessing like proportion uh, uh, of tweets in uh, the four categories, I'm guessing, yeah. Oh, well, so I mean, because this is out in the wild, that's the issue is we don't know what they're not flagging, right? Like, so the way this works is just they, just anytime they're out on Twitter, whenever they see something, they can flag whatever they want. 
Um, or they can go also, there's a bird watch site where anybody, anything that anyone else has flagged shows up. And so then you can go and like vote on whether other people's notes were good and write your own flags and stuff if you want. So <clears throat> here, I'm just showing you the count, the number, the numbers of flag of content that is flagged. Um, and we don't know, basically we don't have the denominator. Um, and that's like a fundamental difference between the field data and the survey data. That's basically the main thing that we gain from the survey data, other than the ability to, in addition to the ability to have like detailed measures of their level of motivation. Um, so if you were to just treat concordant like discordant, you would get equal equality and way lower volume. And then the other way that we can look about it is what happens, what's the flagging behavior of the people that were not politically motivated enough to be able to estimate their, basically these people that don't follow any partisan accounts. Um, and so these might be our partisan saints that just flag lots of false stuff and not any true stuff. But instead what we see is they just don't flag anything at all because they don't care. Um, and, uh, you know, from a, from a statistical perspective among the 90% of users where the partisanship could be estimated, we found that political extremity, so distance from the midpoint uh, of their um, partisan, of their sort of level of partisanship, um, was positively associated with the quantity of notes, and uh, like not correlated with agreement with the fact checkers. So the consistent pattern is that the political motives are increasing the quality, the quantity, without harming the quality. They actually help the quality in the survey experiment, and it's sort of neutral on quality in the field data. So I think that together. All of this suggests that uh, like crowd ratings can actually potentially do a good job of helping identify misinformation at scale and the partisan motives are actually like, you know, uh, critical to the thing working because they help solve the public goods problem um, rather than the sort of uh, force that destroys the whole thing. Um, all of that being said, there's a couple of potential problems that I want to uh, acknowledge before we uh, go to questions. First of all, um, if the thing that's driving people to, to contribute is, you know, to, to flag things are these kind of uh, polarizing uh, motives, then you wind up having very poor coverage for non-polarized topics. Like in this Birdwatch data set, um, the large majority of the flag tweets were either about politics or about COVID, which is just still about politics. Um, but there's tons of other types of misinformation that are out there. It's just nobody cared enough to flag that stuff because they didn't have the, the, the motive. And that goes a little bit to the question in the chat before. Um, also, uh, in the context of US politics, the two sides are roughly equally sized. Um, but in situations where you have uh, asymmetries, like a, mi a majority group and a minority group, then uh, this will be problematic. Like on the one hand, um, you know, misinformation from one side will get just like checked a lot less than the other side. Um, and then also uh, there's, the, I think the bigger question of how do you protect the minority from the tyranny of the majority, which is to say that like, uh, you know, my majority groups have to, if majority groups have like inaccurate beliefs about minority groups that can just be like, you know, sort of cemented into truth by this kind of, uh, aggregation process. And so I think this is a critical question for, um, I think, sort of like theory work on wisdom of crowds is what are like, that's like most of the research in wisdom of crowds is like looking at different aggregation algorithms that are smarter than just averaging the ratings, which is what we're doing here. Um, and so the question is, what are approaches that you can use that, uh, you know, try to use weightings in some way to protect the minority from the tyranny of, of the majority. Um, and uh, then I think also, um, you know, what I've shown here is that in general, people are well behaved, um, but a small number of bad actors can really do a lot of damage. And so I think that the, um, the, the, the key idea here is like, rather than just saying partisanship is bad, really what you need to be doing is looking for the very small number of bad actors that are really trying to take advantage of it. Um, and there are various different ways of doing this, but one idea, which is what the Twitter people have been talking about, is make it so that you need to earn the right to have your flags uh, counted. Um, for example, 
like if you write fact checks that other people uh, vote by that are, that, are, that are rated to be good by at least some people from the other side some of the time that's an indication that you're like a credible person and then that can you know give you the right to to write notes so just to conclude i think that uh, fact checking is great um professional fact checking is great uh and i'm a big fan of it but it, there just aren't enough professional fact checkers um, and so we need something to help uh, supplement professional fact checking. And I think that the wisdom of crowds can help platforms identify misinformation at scale. Um, also, just as a side note that I haven't uh, talked about here, um, we have this whole other line of work on uh, accuracy prompts um, that shows that just asking people to rate the accuracy of content actually has a, a major positive externality of making them less likely to share bad content themselves because when they think about whether this other stuff is accurate, it primes the concept of accuracy and makes them more attentive to accuracy uh, in their own feeds. So that's the sort of like extra bonus. Um, but as we sort of discussed, this uh, wisdom of crowds approach creates this public goods problem where there's the question of why should people bother rating content? Um, and what I have argued here is that political motivations or polarization or whatever you want to call it, which relates to that question in the chat that we'll get to uh, as soon as I wrap this up, they like help drive contributions and they in general, unless the partisan motives are, are really extreme, uh, they tend to drive good contributions. And so the key take home is that platforms should be searching for the zealots to exclude rather than demanding nonpartisan saints because they just won't get anyone. Um, and so I feel like the headline summary is uh, crowdsourcing, I think can help uh, identify misinformation at scale and it can succeed because of rather than in spite of uh, partisan motives. So thanks again to all the people in my group. And again, Jenny and Alan and Cameron Martell were really the big leads on this project. Um, and thanks everybody for listening. And now I'm excited for Q and A. Amazing, thank you so much, David. That was super engaging super well well delivered yeah so it's question time well, i think we have until 4 30 i believe um so yeah please ask your questions via chat or raise your hand um and i will slightly abuse my position of power to ask the first question which i'm curious about um david uh you made this interesting point that um knowledge is is kind of cor uh, um, correlated with partisanship right and polarization so i think affective and issue polarization were, cor were co uh, correlated mm -hmm. with just I'm just wondering, like, do you think if you controlled for knowledge, do you think increasing polarization still would help? Or is it really knowledge that's driving the helping factor here? Yeah, so basically in the model, so in, in, the, uh, in the paper uh, that we are currently still writing, <laughs> that we, we have models where we put all three factors in simultaneously. Um, okay. And the issue polarization, uh, like, Issue polarization and political knowledge are both always positively predictive of discernment. And then as we said, the thing for affective polarization is weaker, but I think it's because of that nonlinearity. Yeah. Um, so it's not, just, it's not just knowledge. Okay, cool. Awesome, well, you have lots of interest, so let's go to the other questions. Um, Jason. Hi, David, uh, uh, great stuff. Um, so I have one kind of shorter question and one uh, longer question that I think are sort of related. So the shorter one is, you know, your main dependent measure is you know, the ratio, the rate at which people flag stuff. But I'm wondering about the other side of the coin, you know, liking or sharing uh, things that you agree with, because I mean, that speaks to virality. I mean, that speaks to the spread of misinformation. Um, That's right. That is not a good signal. <laughs> yeah. You should not you should not use that as a signal for accuracy. Right. Um, but yes, but it might be interesting to track that um, it, it using a similar method, but instead of flagging, um, you know, how likely are you to like it or even retweet or you know, share this? Yeah, so so we have this whole other line of work on the accuracy prompt stuff that shows that like people um, like at baseline. So, you know, say you, you, we've done a bunch of these studies where like half the people we ask them to rate the accuracy of the content and the other half of the people we ask them to say, would you share it or not? <clears throat> you just see this totally different yeah. pattern. When you ask them about accuracy, they're like good at telling truth from false and there's very little difference based on their partisanship. When you ask what they would share, they're almost totally insensitive to accuracy where they're like much more likely to share the things they agree with with the things versus the things that they I don't. See. I see. Um, 
And, and our, our key argument is that that's not actually about, um, about uh, like partisan motives. It's not that people are like purposely sharing false stuff because they are, you know, partisan trolls. But I mean, there's a teeny bit of that, but much more is that people just aren't paying attention to accuracy because the social media context focuses all their attention on the social stuff. They forget to stop and think about whether it's true. And then we've done these experiments showing that if you just prompt the con like prime the concept of accuracy, it increases the quality of what people share, including we did field experiments where we like ask people to rate the accuracy of a random headline and it increases the quality of their subsequent sharing and stuff like that. So I think that like sharing is not a good, it's, it's like not a, a useful thing to use to get insight into whether it's true or not, but mostly because of inattention rather than like partisan motives being king when people are sharing. I see, I see. So if I could just follow up with, um, I think a related question. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a social psychologist and I've done some work in the uh, political psych uh, sphere as well. And so I'm trying to think, you know, um, why do people flag so many false concordant tweets, right? And part of me wonders if it's, you know, to kind of maintain this illusion of objectivity or this appearance of objectivity, right? So people sort of metacognitively sense that if you only express 100% pure partisanship, that causes you to lose touch with credibility, right? And so if you sprinkle in a few self-diminishing, um, you know, um, posts, then, and that almost allow, gives you license to run rampant on the self-enhancing uh, post. Yeah, it's interesting. My take on it is that um, having hung out with political, I mean, with political scientists a bunch the last uh, five or six years, I feel like the, the most surprising thing that I learned was that most people don't care about politics very much. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, that is most like regular people. And mm -hmm. so I think that a lot of the flagging of the false concordant is, I think that there are just like a good chunk of people that just don't care that much about the partisanship and so are like perfectly happy to flag things that are false regardless of whether they align with their politics or not. Um, Even though these are the people in your data who are rating them, you know, turning out to be the highest in partisanship. Right, well, so I think that that's where I was saying before, I agree that that is strange. And there, I think it's because, uh, I think that's the part of partisanship that is, or polarization or whatever, that is the knowledge. You know, because like, because part of that is political knowledge, is like knowledge and part of it is actual uh, political motivation. My, my guess is that like the, the, the increase in the flagging of true, of, of like false concordant is the knowledge part. And then the extra increase in the, in the discordant is the partisan motive. I see, I see. Great. But also like what you're saying also certainly seems plausible, particularly in the context where it's on Twitter and people can see what you're flagging. Um, that I think that some people certainly will have the desire. Yeah, I mean, there's always an audience, right? You're always yeah. performing a bit for an audience. And I think there's kind of like a moral licensing element there maybe as well. Yeah, totally. No, well, thanks. Right. Uh, Nicola? Uh, thank you, David. This was really interesting. And sorry, I will have to leave it a few minutes earlier. So my question is, uh, so I guess the, the flip side um, of being better at, the, at flagging when uh, you are more politically motivated is what, to some extent, social media platforms sometimes mostly care about, which is engagement. So you might be better at flagging, but you also might be more likely to get very excited or angry about certain uh, news uh, that are fake and are fake in a way that stimulates your engagement. So I was wondering, that's a little you know, beyond the scope of this paper, but what, what do you think about it? Yeah, I don't know. I, so my sense is that um, like real misinformation is like a pretty small fraction of what is happening on platforms. Like it's not, that is, I guess it depends on how you want to define it, but certainly the like big news stuff is, is like very low uh, frequency. I guess the polarization stuff, like the polarized stuff 
there's there's more of that but like i from so okay i think it's the other problem is political uh, social media companies are not a, a single entity they're extremely heterogeneous huh. organizations in terms huh. of people, right and so like the people on the misinformation teams are like a hundred percent really committed to like trying to reduce misinformation and toxicity and stuff like that and like figuring out what is good to do that. And then the question is when they have proposals and it goes up the chain, mm. how much appetite is it at the top of the chain? Right. For that? And my sense is that if you can say, I have an intervention that selectively reduces the spread of bad content, they are actually interested in doing that. They're not willing to do it at the expense of reducing engagement with other kinds of Oh. But like, I think if you could have something that's targeted, so that it really is just reducing this kind of content, I think there is appetite to oh, do yes. that okay. because enough. they're getting so much heat from the, you know, and the threat of regulation and stuff. And also, you know, they are fundamentally interested in the user experience. And I think it's this weird thing where like people may engage more with that content, but I don't think they like it more, you know? Fair enough. Yeah, so, good point. Thanks. There's a question from Angelica in the chat. Could you maybe read what... Part of it and answer it. Yeah, great. So it says great research on prompting people towards truth motivates them in that direction. Thank you. Um, in general, without prompting, do you believe people are motivated to flag based on a biased expectation for truth? I mean, because they care about what they believe to be true according to their biases or because they want their views to prevail. Okay, so my take on this is that um, like if you prompt people to think about truth, that will make them uh like when people are thinking about what to share, they are by default not thinking about whether it's true or not. They're thinking about other stuff. And so if you shift their attention to, to accuracy, suddenly they're like, oh yeah, let me think about it. Well, is it true or not? But I think when it comes to having people actually just like make true judgments of accuracy, where I say to you something, do you think this is accurate or not? Just asking that question is automatically focusing your attention on accuracy because I'm asking you, is it accurate or not? And I think that um, there's like a ton of studies that find that um, basically when people are actually judging the accuracy of content, the extent to which it aligns with their politics is not that big, doesn't, like, doesn't affect the responses that much. It does some, it's significant, whatever, but whether the content is actually true or not has a way bigger impact on accuracy judgments than whether it's aligned with people's politics or not. So I think that like people in general when they're judging the accuracy of claims. I mean, sure, they're doing it in light of everything else they know. And so, you know, if you have uh, like a rational truth seeking agent that only watches Fox News and another one that only watches MSNBC, they're going to have very different factual understandings of the world and they're going to rate the same piece of content differently. But like that doesn't necessarily mean they're doing it because they're motivated or they're biased. Uh, it could basically just have like different information streams. So essentially, I feel like. I think that people's processing of information is much less biased by identity than is generally thought. I'm not saying there's no effect. There certainly is a clear demonstrable effect of identity alignment on belief. I just think it's a lot smaller than people tend to think. Thanks. Uh, just a follow up question because, you know, uh, we noticed that in this information, uh, people take uh, the ones producing it take advantage of human biases, you know, confirmation biases, negativity biases. Uh, do you think this is, has become such an industry that's why we have this impression that people care less about uh, truth? Is because you know all the construct, you know, as you said, distracts us so much, and they take so much advantage that. Uh, we get kind of get lost. And then that's why we have this impression that truth doesn't matter, that we are in this post-truth era. Yeah, so my guess about that are two things. One is um, the people that are very loud and who like say a lot of things or post a lot of things are not representative of people in general. And I think a lot of them actually have agendas and are purposely pushing uh, false things for strategic reasons. Um, and so, but then people don't realize that and sort of generalize that to everyone. I think the other thing is you actually have very little signal on what people believe because you can't observe what you be people believe. The only thing you can observe is what people share. But 
as per what I was just talking about a minute ago, I think the sharing is uh, much less discerning than actual belief. And so I think you look at something, you say, wow, look, you know, thousands of people shared this false claim. It must be essentially what you implicitly think is all those people believed it. They must not care about truth anymore. But I think it's more they just weren't paying attention when they were sharing. It. You know? Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, uh, Dujian. Sorry if I said that wrong. Hi, David. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Uh, at the beginning, uh, you talk about the wisdom of crowd. I'm wondering that uh, uh, how well it can be applied to different domains. Because if, uh, for example, if it's uh, common sense knowledge, then I do believe, I mean, it's quite intuitive uh, that uh, uh, the wisdom of crowd can match or maybe convert to the wisdom of uh, experts. But uh, to one extreme, for example, if some most recent work on Riemann hypothesis, I'm not sure if a layman can make any sensible judgment. I mean, at least I cannot make, I, I cannot tell if uh, such an article is true or false. So yeah, I, I just want to uh, yeah, know that uh, for a specific domain, is there any method for us to uh, apply this principle or yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's it's clearly like, there are certain things that I, I'm not going to want to appeal to wisdom of crowds for that, you know, require like a, a really high degree of expertise, but like, and so that was actually like the way I got started on this whole uh, wisdom of crowds and this information thing is in, I think it was early 2017, maybe, maybe 18, I don't know, something like that. Uh, Facebook must have been 18, I think it was, yeah, early 2018, Facebook said, like they announced that they were going to start doing something where they were going to survey people about how much they trusted uh, different news sources. And then they were going to promote content from trusted news sources, like as a way to combat misinformation. And a journalist called me up and said, what do you think? And I was like, sounds like a terrible idea because people have all these partisan motives. And also people aren't experts. Nobody in the appeal, they're like news literacy is really low in the US. People aren't going to be familiar with most of the news outlets. Like how could this possibly work? It seems terrible. And then I was like, oh, like in that conversation, I was like, oh, wait, but actually this is an empirical question that it would be pretty easy to test. Like, hold on, Gordon Pennycook and I will run this experiment tonight and get back to you. And so we just like put together, we ran it, we were like, whoa, it like actually works way better than we thought it was gonna, that's pretty cool. Um, and so I think that like, if this is the spectrum of all things where this is like, how much does a cow weigh? And this is, you know, like Riemann hypothesis kind of thing. And, you know, there's going to be like, you know, here it works really well, here it doesn't work at all. And my sense is like, it's the, 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 how far out it's going to go before it stops working well is going to be much more complicated than your intuition is. Sure. Yeah. So maybe it's like when every time when it comes to a new domain, then you first do some empirical check. It's like some sanity check to ensure that it still makes sense to some level. And then you. Yeah. I mean, and that's my general approach on anything essentially is like, you should always test it. <laughs> sure. um, and there's like a lot of work in within the field of uh, within a crowd, I'm sure on like, what are the domains where it works, works or better. And then also things in like, how can you make it more or less effective in any given domain? Like does communication help or hurt amongst the crowd and all different kinds of things like that. That's right. like a whole field of study on that stuff. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Victoria. Yeah. Oh, thanks for the amazing talk. Um, so the question that I have is about the research that you mentioned that you've done cross-culturally, collecting data in several countries. So unlike the U.S., most countries are not bipartisan. Uh, and I, this is something that I struggle in my own research. So I just wanted to know, how do you approach conceptualizing this idea of like concordant and discordant in those contexts that are not yeah. just bipartisan? It's a great question, and I don't have a great answer. Um, which is that uh, in the cross-cultural study that we did, um, the, it was COVID-based. So basically we like, you know, leveraged the existence of COVID to be like, here's one set of statements that is relevant everywhere in the world. Uh, and therefore like not having to figure out like, what are the, or like, not having to have separately tailored uh, things in every country because then you can't really compare them. But more generally, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. Like we, we have a study that we did um, in Ukraine a few years ago, 
where the like we thought the relevant axis there was like pro Russia versus not pro Russia, uh, and that's something that you can sort of collapse into like a dimension. But more generally, it's a good question, and and presumably you can sort of like map the different parties. You know, there's there's some kind of network. Like other thing about you, have like the parties exist in some, uh, you know, like space of like how close or not close they are to each other. And then you can think about any given two parties, like how far apart are they from each other? Uh, and something like that. But like, it's, it, I think that this concept of polarization, the way that we think about it in the US does not map very well onto much of the rest of the world. So that's, a, that's an excellent point. Great. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions, um, if there are any. Um, there aren't any hands at the moment, but I do have a question that I could ask. Um, uh, I'm curious, David, like, is your vision like kind of rolling this out on different platforms kind of at scale? And if so, I'm wondering if you've thought about or if you think maybe this is not quite your job, but, um, you know, what the kind of reaction of the of the platform of like the communities would be um, to that, like if they knew that they could wield some kind of power by just downvoting stuff or flagging stuff would that potentially pose like a incentives problem. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's interesting. I think that this is like a key question with this stuff is as it's rolled out at a larger and larger scale, uh, to what extent do things start breaking down? And I think that, you know, that's where you need things like these reputation systems or things like that, where people can earn in, basically people have to earn the right to flag by somehow showing that they're doing good work. And the key question is, how do you how do you do that? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, also, I realized that um, if people are interested, we have a review. This is like a review article that sort of summarizes uh, a lot of the stuff that I talked about around crowds being effective in in the space. Cool. Can we grab your slides too? I don't know if you've sent them already. Oh, over. yes. Uh, yeah, I'll send them. Over. Cool. Thanks so much. Okay, well, I think it's about time to wrap up. So I just have some closing remarks here. First of all, thank you so much, David, for spending the time to go through this uh, with us. Uh, yeah, incredibly important and really kind of clear results too. So um, yeah, that was a real pleasure. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we do have uh, another talk next week. So uh, please join us April 5th uh, for a talk by Sven Nyholm uh, from the University of Munich, who's gonna be talking about AI responsibility gaps and asymmetries between praise and blame. But um, before then, just let's thank uh, David one more time. Thank you so much, David. Uh, and yeah, um, see you next week. Take care, all.